Today's sermon is entitled, How We Should Move. How We Should Move. That We need to get an idea of how we should move. If you look at the picture on the screen, it's a picture of oarsmen. It's a picture of an Olympic team that is um, rowing. They are rowing together. You see the people rowing in the boat, and most of you know that in rowing, especially in racing, the most effective way to win is to row together. Say that with me, row together. One more time, row together. So the key to movement, the title of the sermon is how we should move. I want you to understand that if we're going to move, we need to move together. So in understanding this passage today, if we're going to be effective in how we act, in our actions, our mobility, um, active energy, we're going to have to change our tune from moving as individuals to moving as part of a more valuable and much necessary team. We must start seeing our lives in a way that includes others, that every Christian should be on a team. Some of you have gone as far as you can go on your own. You have maxed out. You as a resource can do no more on your own. Your one man band or one woman band te team is over. And I'm not sure when the church became so isolated or bifurcated. And I think the reason people are so flustered as Christians and frustrated is because they see their lives separately and they can't find satisfaction when trying to satisfy both lives. So in other words, they see God doing things when they come to church as a Christian and they feel good, but when they go to work, they feel horrible and they can't get along with nobody or their marriage is in trouble. And so because life is all separate, they're frustrated because I want to see God like I see God in church on Sunday. I want to see God at, at work on Monday. You know what I'm saying? I want to see God in my children. I want to see God in my attitude. I want to see God in everything. And when you don't see God in the totality of your life, it frustrates you. And so I want to talk about that because that means you aren't moving together. There's a reason God calls us the people of God. He calls us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. He doesn't call us individuals. He calls us a group of people. And he calls us that because we are part of a family. And there is a reason for that, that when he moves, when he does things, he does them with the group. So we are a people on the move. Why don't you say that with me? We are a people on the move. One more time. We are a people on the move. But if you're going to move, if we're going to move, we must move as one. So let me explain using Israel as an example. Check this out. Israel moved as one people. Israel moved when they moved as one people people, one nation. They had one God and one focus. So Israel as the nation was a monotheistic nation, meaning they had one God. Now, Egypt and the surrounding nations were polytheistic, meaning they had multiple gods. Um, you know, they had different I won't name any of them, but Israel was a people to one God. And so if you study Israel, you know that Israel was 
called to the promised land. When we think about the Jews, we think about, oh, they were called to Canaan or Jerusalem. They had this promised land, right? And so they started out their journey. We talk about them crossing the river Jordan and going on the journey. They moved as a people. It wasn't, it's not a story about Moses moved. It wasn't a story about Joshua moved. It was a story about Abraham. It was, it was a story about how the people moved collectively. So if we're going to be Christians, we've, we've got to learn where are we moving to? How, how are we moving? As the sermon title is, how we should move in 2022. So they started their journey together, but then, but then, Joy, they got to the wilderness. And the wilderness created some challenges. It, you know, but they were, but watch this again. They were challenges to the group. They were problems for the people. And most of us think, you know, I'm going through. I'm going. No, you're not going through. We're going through. An attack on you is an attack on us. And so because we have lost sight of that, we isolate and we don't come to church. I'm just going through right now. I'll be back to church. No, 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 no. You, you should be at church. You should be with the rest of the body because you're in the wilderness and that wilderness creates challenges. You get tested. So while you're a group, watch this now, you're a group in the wilderness, you're doing the best you can. Then Israel got to the place. Finally, they came out of the wilderness. He said, long enough, you've been circling the mountain. They get to the place, but they can't sustain the blessing. Why? Because they can't. He told them, go into the land, possess the land, take over the people in the land. Well, instead of taking over the land, they blended in with the land. They started marrying the people in the land. They started picking up the tools and the trades of the land. And so this unity began to break down from being in the wilderness and from having to fight once they even got to the place that was a blessing. And it's ironic that you're in a place that God blessed you with and you're still not happy. Why? Because you're not there as a group. You're there and you're broken. You're torn. You're not healthy. You're not well. And so you want to blame everybody else for what they're doing to you when a healthy person understands that it's not just what you're doing to me. If you attack me, you attack God. You attack us. So there's this understanding that they began to break down and the North began to fight the South. There was a civil war in Jerusalem and they broke up, they fell apart. And ultimately they rejected Christ when Christ the Messiah came. So there was a separation. So the unity, the group who started moving together ended up breaking up and rejecting Christ. And Christ is the glue that holds all of us together. So regardless of wherever I am or wherever you are, the fact that we accept Christ as our savior should be the unifying factor of us being a group that moves together. But there's similar patterns here. I bring up Israel as a pattern, as an example to help us see how that works in other ways. So watch this. This pattern, we have movements because movements have patterns. When you look at the waves in the water, when you look at movements, uh, ripples, um, or how you walk, or the things that move, how a bird flies, they have patterns. If you look at them, you can notice patterns about movements. So a similar example is Adam and Eve and the church. So let's talk about Israel as a movement of a people. What about Adam and Eve who represent all of humankind? that they represent the movement of us as natural human beings. What is the pattern for us as humans? Stay with me. I'm going to teach for a minute. I'll, I'll get to something in a second. Stay with me. Keep your ears on. Don't fall asleep. That Adam and Eve represent the group of every man, woman, boy, and girl on the earth. And so God called them, right? Like Israel was called to Jerusalem, God 
created Adam and Eve and said, hey, I want you to rule over the earth. I want you to, you know, kind of manage things here for me and do this or that. And then, then old serpent shows up, wilderness experience, and begins to tempt them and test them, right? And so now they're questioning stuff. Now the, the team is about to break up because Eve, Adam trying to hold on to what God said, don't eat this fruit. Well, Eve decides, okay, I'm going to believe the serpent. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat the fruit. And then she gave it to Adam. Said, I'm going to break the law and let you break it too. So the pattern is we get the call, we start out on the call, and then we mess up. So there's this call. Let's talk about the other example. So Adam and Eve represents all of humankind. We were called to live higher. We were called to live better. But now we shoot people. We kill people. We cuss people out. We hurt people. We've messed up, right? Now let's talk about the church. Because that's the natural side. Let's talk about the pattern of the church. Well, the church is called to salvation. The church is called. He says, well, whosoever will uh, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, whoever wants to come and be invited to salvation, great. So you've been tainted with sin from the beginning. Adam and Eve messed that up for you. Now I'm going to give you a chance to be redeemed. So I'm calling you. Come to me. Come to Jesus. We sing the song. I sang it this week, yesterday, in the kitchen and cried. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus just now. He will save you. He will save you. Yeah, anyway, never mind. The call is come to Jesus. Get your life right. All right, well, here we come. Here we come, Tony. Oh, I'm saved. I get to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. And then I'm going back out and I'm smoking, I'm getting high, I'm drinking, I'm lying, I'm stealing, I'm cheating. In other words, I've got a journey. It's not that I get saved and then it's all well. It's not that uh, God told Israel, you're the promised chosen people, and then all of a sudden, poof, they're there. No, there's a journey. In other words, there's movement that has to be made to get you to the place that you're supposed to be in. And the best way to get there is to move together. So the church falls apart. The church falls short because there's all this separation. Baptists can't get along with Methodists. Methodists can't get along Presbyterian. Presbyterian can't get along with Catholic. Holiness, fire, baptized. Can't get along with the charismatic. Can't get along with the evangelicals. We can. We all. We all over the place, and we're we're broken. So we don't have this unity. We, we all say we're moving toward God, though, and but but we're but we're not moving together. So what is it about this unity? What is it about unity that creates such a meaningful purpose on when we move? What is it about unity that impacts? our movement how does unity impact our movement so that when we move we impact the place we move to i'll say that again what is it about unity moving together that impacts our movement so that we can impact where we're going uh, but what is the destination the question is then as israel had a destination of Jerusalem, they were going to the promised land. What is the destination of the church? Hmm. Well, you might say heaven, right? Would well, you just want to go to heaven? Well, I'm not sure. It is, is the destination of the church to go to heaven? If the destination of the church was to go to heaven, then okay, all of us die right now together, and then we go to heaven. Can't be the destination is not heaven. Uh, got a little tricky here, Ben. Now I got you interested. So we can't gloss over the destination of the church because it's different from Israel's. And the question is, where are we going? If we move in joy, where, where, where are we moving to? So check this out. What is the destination of the church? That is the question. Where are we going? PC, you're talking about acts. You're talking about the acts and the actions of acts. Actions for what? Where are we going? Where are we moving to? If you say you're moving from a 
apartment to a house, people are going to ask you, where are you moving to? If you go to UPS or you go to some uh, shipping company, they say, well, where do you want this to go to? What, what, what is the destination? People look at your life. Movement implies a destination. But what we learn about the destination of the church is that the destination is not a place. Ooh. So we're not trying to get to a place, LaTanya. We're not trying to get to a place. The destination is to become. The destination we're moving toward is a place of being. It is a place of existence. It cannot be heaven because there's no work needed for heaven. In other words, there's no movement needed to get to heaven. The Bible says when we go to heaven, we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. There's no real movement in that. You just, you, you pop up there. Movement implies one step after the other. Movement implies progression. My statement is, Shauna, what are we progressing toward? I got a feeling. What are we moving toward Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? What am I progressively developing toward? In other words, work is needed for movement. You see, you get older, right? And it, it takes a little longer to get up out the couch. Movement is needed. And where there's movement, there is energy that is needed. So work is involved in movement. You don't need work for heaven. Heaven is given to you by faith. But you must work toward the destination of becoming the person God wants you to be before you go to heaven. Uh, you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna work with me here. You want me to do something different. It's harder. Now listen to me. It's work. Listen, listen, Riri. It's harder to, to, to work or to bring things about when you involve others. It's easier if I do it by myself. You ever had somebody doing something for you? They, you feel like they're not doing it right. You say, never mind. Let me do it myself. We think it's easier to do it. So, so whenever we move together, it involves work. And it's work because we must work with other people. And that is the nature of selfishness and the lack of faith in others. Others, Selfishness is lack of faith in others. In other words, you do it by yourself because you don't trust that anybody can do it better than you. So you're the Lone Ranger, the band of I, me, and only. All you do is everything for you. But the lack of unity means there is a lack of faith. And the Bible says Israel did not enter into the promises of God like they fully should because of lack of faith, meaning they didn't trust one another. They didn't trust God completely. They trusted. They wanted a king. They wanted idols. They did all these things. They didn't trust who they were supposed to trust. And I'm saying to you, we will never make it to our destination if we don't move together. And the only way we move together is if we start trusting each other. To reach there, we have to have trust. To reach there, we, I'm going to say that, say that with me. To reach there, we have to have trust. One more time. To reach there, we have to have trust. Trust is essential for unity. God, so if we're going to move together, if we go back to the example of the rowers who are rowing, they must trust that their partner is going to hit the water with the oar at the same time. And the more precise we are in our actions together, the faster we move. So we need to do it together. Listen to me. 
because listen, it is too much to attain all at once. Listen, what God has for you, oh, I'm teaching now, Cynthia, what God has for you, Nemesis, it is too much for you to attain on your own all at once. The blessings of God are too big for us as individuals. So it is counterproductive for me to think that I'm going to harvest the blessing of God as a single individual. Ah, watch this. Let me put it to you like this. It's like bringing in groceries. There are too many bags for one person. Come on. So either you make a hundred trips or you do it with others and make the trips considerably less. So in other words, instead of you making 20 trips to get the bags, you say, Joy, can you help me bring in the bags? You ask your kids, come on, Tavio, help me bring in the, 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 the groceries. In other words, you enlist other people to help you bring in the blessing that you can't bring in by yourself. Now you can but it's going to take you longer. And my point is how we should move in 2022. In other words, to cut down on the delays that we are seeing less of God's promises because we are refusing to move with other people. And even your own body, God, listen to me with this little bin even your own body has to work together to bring in the bags you're carrying. Your knee has to bend. Your hand has to clutch. Your back has to bend. You have to pick up. Your muscles have to lift. You have to work with yourself. <laughs> your body has to move together. You can't even handle God's blessing when you're broken into many pieces. Part of your mind is at the job. Part of your mind is with your ex and half of you is with your current and you, <laughs> I ain't going to go there. <laughs> but only, listen, only you can control your body, not anyone else's. And so we think that because we can't control people, we say, I'll do it myself. And that kind of delusion already says you're not together because anyone who thinks they can do it all themselves has a split somewhere. Let's look at the text and let me read you some Bible to help you understand this. The Bible says, I therefore prisoner of the Lord, talking about Paul, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Watch this now. Here's the text with all lowliness and gentleness with long suffering bearing with one another in love. Talking about this whole partnership. Here it is, verse three, our key verse, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You gotta work at the unity. Verse four, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, a lot of ones there, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, through all, in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, single body of Christ, till we all come, uh-oh, till we all reach, till we all get where? To the unity of of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to a, to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So 
The question is, how does this passage tie into how we should move? First, we see in order to move, you have to have somewhere to go, and a place to go usually involves an invitation or a choice or a call. There has to be an identification of a place. If I'm a move, where I move to? I'm getting, sometimes I walk around, I start walking toward the kitchen, I say, what was I going to get? I forgot. If I don't know what I'm going to get, what's the point of moving? Stay right there. So the whole aspect of movement, if you're gonna move, where are you going? If we do move, why is it important though that we move as one? So watch this. The first part of the move is the call. In other words, you gotta have a call. People on the move have to have an invitation or be called to move somewhere. So in 2022, you understand that somebody's got to call you. You've got to be part of an invitation, a movement. So when we talk about movement, where is it that you're headed? Who invited you? You can't get in the party unless you have an invitation. I was watching Frasier and they wanted access to this really bougie spa and resort. And they were only on the gold level. Well, they weren't on no level. Actually, they stole their neighbor's invitation, went to the place and said, we're so-and-so. They lied and said they were their neighbor's name. And the guy at the counter said, you can only get in if you have an invitation. Oh God, come on. And I'm saying to some of you that what God has for you in 2022, do you even know where your invitation is? What is it that you're going to get from God? This vague and ambiguous walk of Christianity that aimlessly meanders throughout spirituality, taking whatever comes, needs to be unhitched. You are unharnessed and you need to find the togetherness again of the partnership with God and the people he's given to help you get there because people don't just move for no reason. Most moves are made for a purpose. So when people talk about I'm making moves this year, they usually not well, what making moves to do what? I'm about to buy this car wash down the street. In other words, if you moving and you don't even know what you're moving toward, you're confused, honey. God calls us because he has a purpose on our lives and he has a purpose for us to move. I feel my help coming. When you know what God has called you to do, then you're going to start moving toward being. Uh, so the call is an invitation. It's a reason to go. Do, do you have a reason to get up each day? Do, did you wake up this morning with a reason? Uh, to, why open your eyes if you ain't got nothing to do? Why is God keeping you alive if he doesn't have a place for you to move? Do you see each day as an invitation to come closer? Uh, let me look at verse number one, Ephesians 4. Verse 1 says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling or vocation. Walk worthy of the invite with which you were called. You've been invited by God with an invitation. He says, walk worthy of that. We've been invited to do something. We've been invited to be somebody. You've been invited to be better than your yesterday you. You've been invited by being awakened this morning. God says, come closer to me. You have a job to do. When you open your eyes, it is an invitation from God. And the term, the Greek term for calling is a strong summons. It means a voice is calling out to someone. In other words, when God wakes you, and not the bird that wakes me up in the morning making all that noise, but God is saying, wake up, Charles. Wake up, Luanda. Wake up, Lou. Wake up, the Grizz. There's things for you to do when mama would say uh you get wash your hands get ready to eat she had she had called she made a call to do what 
come to the table. When Joy and I say plating, plating, sometimes we say we're about to plate. That means get ready to get ready. In other words, you know, we're about to, in other words, I, and so when she says plating, I move. I move because she called me. I got to talk it. I move because I have been invited to the table. Dinner is ready. And I'm saying to some of you, move because God has invited you to something better. He's invited you to a better job. He's invited you to a more peaceful relationship. He's inviting you to having better patience and palpability with the people you don't even like. God is calling you uh, to understand your self-servantness, your own unique quirks and uh, things that you need to work on. Every day is an opportunity to move, and some of us need to move because God's call on our lives should keep us moving. And if you're stagnant, if you ain't doing nothing, then you aren't hearing anything. I set you up. I set you up. You move because you hurt heard something. If you aren't moving, then you aren't hearing anything. So I thank God for a church and a pastor that will say something that makes me move. <laughs> to know what to do, you have to know you. To know what to do, you have to know you. So we have a church that often talks about what I should do. We need to learn more about us and how God uses us because hearing God is hearing what he's saying about me. Hearing God is not, what can I do with a story about Moses on the mountain? I must be able to apply that story to me. How can I enact the way, the way that Moses moved or parted the sea? What can I part in my own life? Just as Moses led the people through the Red Sea, who am I leading through? Uh, God, I feel him. He says, it is the call that makes me keep preparing my sermons. It's God's call. PC, here, I want you to preach this Sunday. I heard you. Get ready. Plate it. In other words, get ready. Serve it. In other words, study it. In other words, before Sunday even happens, boo, I am getting ready. Why? Because I got the call long before Sunday at 945. I am respond to emails. I respond to prayer requests. I respond to teaching because he keeps calling me. He keeps giving me new insight. He keeps dropping something in my spirit. This morning when I woke up, I got a new word. And it's about how when people hit you, they prophesy and ask Jesus, who hit you? What is the purpose of them saying, who hit you? Do you know who hit you? Uh, I'm going to preach that one day. It's coming. But the question is, where is the call summonsing you to? I got to move on. The number two is the destination. We all have a destination and we all are going to the same place. So please don't dismiss me as not valuable or relevant because baby, you're going to the same place I'm going to. The destination is, listen here, I, you ain't going, listen, you ain't going nowhere different than I am. So stop devaluing me. Stop making you feel like making me feel inferior or that you're better than I am. We are all going to the same destination. So please don't dismiss me. We are equal in where we're going. So in, stop, in other words, stop creating this Christian competition between each other that we are all going to the same place. In fact, it is important that we all get there. Why? Because remember the destination for us is that the place is us. The place is not a geographical grounds. It is not a location. The place is the forming of us. So when you put me down, you cancel our arrival. You impede upon our developmental ability. The best thing for us to do as Christians is to put our heads together and start moving toward the same place. Stroke and then there's always a moderator at the point of the at the at the, the rowboat and he says stroke. He tries to tell you how to and that's what I am. I'm here on Sunday and I'm saying stroke. I'm trying to get you to get your kids in tune. Get them to act right because they need to be in agreement with what the family, so that the family stroke, you can't get the new house, you can't get the new Christmas gifts, you can't get the new things that you want, you can't get a new anointing, a new power, if everybody ain't 
stroke? You can't, the, the kids can't be stroking left and you stroking right and the husband ain't stroking at all. And, I mean, you got everybody. So come online, come to Breath for Change. This is a commercial. Come to Breath for Change so that you can hear PSA say stroke. In other words, we've got to find a way to work together, cutting people off. Or for or or cutting people off or solo flying delays our destination. In other words, help people get there. Don't leave them behind. When you cut people off, you're saying, "Get away from me. Leave you behind, dummy." Don't you know we are the body of Christ? We are one, and we are trying to get there together. The plight of the impact of the Christian church is that we are too divided. We are too broken up, and people don't respect us and people don't perceive us as a people of unity because we can't even go to the same place together. If everyone is going to the same place, would you listen, Wendy? Would you, if everybody, Wendy, is going to the same place, in essence, we should be able to ride in the same car. Huh, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy? We should be able to ride in the same car. But the reality is, somebody gonna get in your car, oh, I don't like the music you listening to. Oh, you come to my church. Oh, we I want hymns. I want fast songs. In other words, you in my car, we all going to the same place, but you don't like the music. Or you don't like the window. It's too cold. It's too hot. Some will say you drive too fast. I, I like the AC on. And we all going to the same place. Can you ride long enough just for us to get to the place? But these are all excuses. These are all excuses for wanting to drive your own self. People will not carpool because they don't want to be inconvenienced to wait to pick up two or three people so they can get in the carpool lane and get to work on time. they rather drive in two, three-hour traffic by themselves because they cannot meet an agreement of unity to ride what I'm preaching already. You don't even know it. That's okay. But these are all excuses, and it makes the trip longer, and it makes it more confusing. So now you've got time to be depressed. You in the car for three hours in traffic, so now you got time to think about where where was he last night? Now you got time to think about, I'm getting too fat. Now you got time to say, I'm not as pretty as everybody else. But with, if you'd have been in the fast lane with other people in the carpool, you ain't got time to think about gossip and all the negative stuff going on in your life because you're in the car with other people who are thinking positively, talking positively. They ain't bringing up exes and problems and depression. They're talking about getting to work and making changes. We will never become who we're called to be if we don't learn to move together. Look at verse 13. The Bible says in 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge. Look at the text. Till we all come to the unity, to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a what? Perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 4.13 is not about arriving to a place. Look at the text. It's about becoming a better person or people. That our goal and destination ought to be to be better Christians, better, more perfect people who measure up to who Christ is. That my goal is not a bigger house. My goal, God, I feel him, is not a bigger car. My goal is not a bigger business and a bigger paycheck. My goal is to develop into a better person. Huh? And that in being a better person, I will get a higher wage. I will get a better house. I will get better relationships till we all come. In other words, ride with me till we all in other words, let's move to notice it didn't say till you come it says till we all come in other words, move to get stroke in other words, keep moving to get till we all get there in other words, stop leaving folk behind get the person who had a baby out of wedlock, like, come on honey, you had the baby let's raise them together, come on you been to jail, come on now you finished come on, let's get it together, come on all you been smoking, drink, come on come on, come on, that's why I pastored the grace place, the church where imperfect people worship a perfect God. Ain't nobody perfect but God. Let us bring all of our baggage to the house of God and say, Lord, help us move together. I want to be better. Somebody shout, I want to be better. This better people, though many, is one man. And we've got to learn that there's a whole lot of people in the body, but we're still all one. The man is described as perfect. And the 
man is perfect because he is complete. It means he is full. In other words, everybody who's supposed to be in the man is in the man. You cannot be perfect if you're missing something. So God says you are moving together. You can't get there unless everybody comes with you. I dare you in your family. How dare you? Not I dare you, but how dare you leave your husband behind? How dare you leave your kids? How dare you leave your cousin in trouble behind? How dare you pray about one side of the family, but don't pray about the other? How dare you? Your family will never be what it's supposed to be if you don't bring everybody in the family with a stroke. You've got to find a way to understand that your success is my success. And when I win, you win. Your hurt is my hurt. As Kendrick Lamar's new song, Heart, says, I am all of us. Come on now. The destination equals a vocation. It equals a growth. It equals an ability to become. It is an invitation to be better. God says, come, be better. The perfect man, as described, is who we were created to be. But the fall, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, messed it up. So the journey begins. We establish churches and pastors and preachers who are trying to help us get to the perfect man. And I'm telling you, if we're ever going to be who we're called to be, we got to do it together. Somebody say together. The destination and the goal is to reach the full measured stature of Christ. Look at the text. It says, till we reach the measure. In other words, I was making waffles yesterday and the waffles calls for two cups of flour. I'm making them from scratch, but I got to feel it all the way. And so when I'm shaking it, I got to make sure it get a right on the line. God bringing you to church. He goes, shake it. He said, I want you to reach the full measure. In other words, I can't make waffles if I don't have enough milk. I can't make waffles if I ain't got no eggs. I can't make waffles if I ain't got no vanilla. I ain't telling you all the everything because you might try to make it. But I'm telling you, you will never be able to be a waffle if you don't have all the ingredients. I'm preaching and you don't know it. You've got to reach the full measure. And 2022 has a full measure. But the only way we're going to get there is if we meet it together. It's not a waffle till I put it all together. The instructions say put in the eggs and whip them up first. Sometimes I just think put the eggs in there, put the flour. No, you got to whip the eggs first. Then you put the flour in. Then you pour the milk in. Then you put the oil in. You got to bring it together. It's only together does it put a waffle. Joy like the waffle with the catfish. And I got to put it all together before I put it on the iron. And then it comes on the iron and then it's got to be cooked. And then it's got to be presented. It's got to be hot and hot butter and hot syrup all on top of it. I'm getting hungry. It's not good until it's together. And some of you are not good. You're not being recognized because you won't do it together. You won't involve your co-workers. You keep trying to do it on your own and the job will never recognize you because the job is not about you. It's about the business. We have been called to conform to the image of Christ. Romans 8.29, write that down, Shana. Romans 8.29 calls us to conform to the image of Christ and the destination is unity. God calls us to unity. Unity has to be arrived to. It has to be aspired toward as well as the greater knowledge of the Son of God. The Bible says till we all come to the unity, we've got to work toward it. We've got to go toward it. We've got to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Unity must become again our narrative. We've got to make unity as a part of our vocabulary. We must know who we're trying to become. I love that. Why not learn together? Amen. If I'm trying to learn who I am, why not learn next to me? Why not learn together in college? Joy, don't they have study groups? They have study groups. Why? Because study groups are easier to learn together. They are formed because it's easier to learn as a group than it is as an individual. How many people say, I can learn Jesus on my own. I don't need to go to church. I don't need no church. I don't I don't I live already on my own. I don't do church. Church is learning. Church is for learning together because le- church is a study group. And everybody here who just cussed at each other, who messed up, who smoked or drank, fell out, lied, did whatever, all of us in here. Ain't no 
nobody perfect. You got to quit pointing the finger. Oh, look at so-and-so. Skirt all high. Look here, honey. Her skirt is high, but your lie is high. You keep lying. You, you, you got to, Lindy, look here. Don't talk about how high it is and you high on something else. You smoke all day. Never, never mind. I ain't going to mess with that. The reason it's now a destination for us is because we fail and what we were birthed to become was removed by sin and now God says I need you to move together the only way I'm going to turn your life around and churches aren't preaching it we're talking about getting rich and talking about buying houses I'm telling you we need to go back to the old church way and talk about singing together don't you remember when the choir used to march in we march in together when the preachers would come in they would come in together when the ushers come down to give the offering they do it together Everybody used to do it together And we've got to find our way back to together So what does that journey look like And what kind of help do we have to get there Let's dig a little deeper Let me show you the journey As I begin to wrap this up I'm almost out of time Ephesians 4 As I indicated earlier Our journeys exist because life is too much To bring it in all at once We need help I need help My life is too big The blessing and call on my life is too big for me God has given me me so many gifts I can't even operate the gifts by myself it's not that I need help out of pity it's not that oh I need your help because I'm too weak no I need your help because it's smarter it's wiser to enlist other people it makes sense for to get other people involved instead of you trying to bring all the groceries in by yourself boy get out of bed come get some of these bags mama you tell me you boy ch cherry come get some of these bags out there 69 Mustang that was giving us fumes, fumes and burning our eyes it is the way God intended for us to move. God wants us to move with people. God put people in the world who can help you. You've got to be more than an isolated hermit. You've got to be somebody who welcomes people in. No more moves on my own. I'm opening up my life to similar colleagues that move the same way I move. I need to find people who are moving the way I move, Lisa. Come on, Mama McCain. Who's moving like me? In other words, who Who's in a situation I'm in? Who knows about hospitalization? Who knows about child rearing? Who knows about owning an op uh, entrepreneurial business? Who knows about opening a new business? Who knows about preaching? Who knows about hairstyling? Who knows about what I know about? I got to find those people. You keep finding people who ain't even doing what you doing. Stop connecting with people. Ah, watch this now. You got to learn how to move in 2022. How do you move? You move as a unit. U-N-I-T. Uh-oh. Unit. Oh, equals with Y. Unity. Oh, unity is one unit. It is a unit with the Y. Ah, this year I'm moving like a unit with Y. I'm moving like a unit with Y. But there are things and tools the enemy uses to keep us from moving like we should. Look at the part of this text. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, walk worthy. In other words, you got to walk worthy. The invite, you ain't going to get in. You don't walk worthy. Look at this. He says in verse 2, he says, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, this is how you're going to get in. In other words, the journey is walk worthy of the invite. Act like you should have been invited. That's what the text is saying. Act like you should have been invited. Walk worthy of the journey. Act like you should have been invited. In other words, be lowly. In other words, be long-suffering. Have bearing patience with other people. These are the things that work against unity. Pride. What does the text say? He says, walk with all lowliness and gentleness. When you are not low and you act in pride, that breaks people up. It is arrogance and it is pride that breaks up unity. People who are not patient, people who are not meek, people who are not long suffering. In other words, you can't tolerate other people. All you can tolerate is you. Man, you will break up the unit. I'm telling you, these are things that break up unity. Number three, he says, forbearing one another in love. In other words, you, not, you can't get along with others. Well, duh, that'll break up unity. When you can't forbear somebody who messes up, you will break up the unity. And how dare you sit up there and act like you are so perfect when people have messed up. God is saying, yes, they messed up. Yes, they hurt you. Yes, they wronged you. Forbear it in love. Why? Because we all got to get there together. In other words, you can't.
can't castigate somebody else. You can't cut them off because cutting them off is cutting you off. And you can't get blessed because you won't forgive somebody, ah oh God, who you don't even have a heaven or hell to put them in, but you're going to hold them hostage till we get there. God said, get those people out of your trunk. When you don't forgive people, it's like riding with them in your trunk. They always with you. You don't want them in your car. You don't want to say nothing to them, but you want them in your trunk. Meaning you always want to know in your mind you harming them. That's what lack of forgiveness is. You riding with people in your trunk. I'm telling somebody at the altar today, go to your trunk, get the key out, let those people free. Because when you hold them up, you hold you up. You will never get to your destination. And the good news is that God gave us resources to help us get there. He gave us pastors. He gave us teachers to help us attain there. So look at verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, he himself gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. There it is. He gave us pastors for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. He says, I gave you teachers and leaders to help you be lowly, to help you be meek, to help you be gentle. I've given you these people for the work. Of, they are equipping you. Pastor Cherry is trying to equip you. Why not listen to what he is saying? For the work of the ministry, the work is what? What's the work? To grow, to be better. PC is equipping you to be better. I'm not equipping you to be rich. I'm equipping you to have a better attitude, to have greater integrity, a better character. The work is the vocation. The work is to grow up to be a perfect man. We do that by working in the world. My working with you is ultimately to build up the body of Christ. Helping you helps the body. Every time I help you, Tony, I'm helping the body. When one part of the body is sick and gets better, it impacts the whole. When you win, I win. I celebrate you. I want to start a movement called the Activate 20. It about 20. It about 20. It's about 20 of us online. I want to activate 20. If I can get 20 activated in the workplaces, we have moved as a unit in this church. If we can move you to being better people on your job, we have activated 20. More to come on that later. This is why God says, learn to move as a unit. But, but unity is not as easy as it may sound. Watch this now. The final aspect of this is the unity. And we will see in the Bible that unity must be worked on. Unity must be worked on. It has to be endeavored to maintain. Unity doesn't come easy. So what do we do when something is too hard? Well, we usually quit. If it's too hard, we quit. And we start living as single entities and we lose our effectiveness as a collective unit. And I came to tell all you single individual uh, robo cops out there, lone rangers who trying to do it yourself, that day has to end now. I saw a picture this week of organized fish running from one big fish. It was like a thousand of these little fish, all of them running scared in a panic from one big fish and then the turned around and the picture showed the little fish organizing to form into a bigger fish than the big fish that was chasing them they turned around and chased the big fish away and I'm telling you the only reason why our culture the black culture has not done what we're supposed to do is because we can't get unified if we were unified if we got some strategy as a one group of people we could walk up to Congress and demand some stuff. But we can't demand nothing because we can't figure out, well, who's going to be in charge? Well, where the money going to go? Well, I want a position. Well, you didn't get my business cards. Well, you too light. Are you black enough? We can't get together. Whenever you get unified, you can get power because movement occurs when everything is working together. Ain't no car getting out your driveway if the carburetor don't work with the valves and the fuse. Yeah, listen, what some of us need is not a miracle from God. You just need better organization. I'm preaching now. Some of you don't need, you praying, oh Jesus, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. God said just get yourself organized. If you get better organized, you can chase the demons away. Get what you already have in order and you can turn some stuff around. You can't 
face life without a strategy. You can't face life by not responding to it. Some of you keep ignoring stuff. That's getting organized. You need to get organized by opening the mail, facing the mail, calling the people saying, this is what I can do. Take it or leave it. I'm handling it. In other words, you start telling the creditors back up because this, I'll give you $25 a month. Either you want it or not. And they say, well, whatever. Listen, you are responding to life. Stop ignoring the problems in your life. You are somebody. Watch this. As they told Elisha at Dothan, he said, God said, there's more with you than there are with them. When you feel like you're alone and the creditors are all against you, think about your Pastor Cherry. Think about Wendy. Think about Riri. Think about Sharon. Think about Dickie. Think about all of us standing there. You're going to pay that bill off, honey. We are all standing with you because your lack of debt is our lack of debt. <laughs> you can't let depression rob you of a win that is already to declare yours by God. Here's the final scripture, verses three through six. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity, to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. You've got to work at it, he's saying. Verse four, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called, one hope of calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He says, one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all, the unity, maintain the unity. You've got to get this unity. And what is unity? Unity is agreement. It is moving in concert. It is stroking together. It is getting along with all the moving parts, all the moving parts working as they should, bringing life all into one. Listen, I want you to start bringing your work into godliness. I want you to bring your relationship into God, your boo. I want you to bring your boo. You can't date nobody and not talk about God. What's wrong with you? You better date him and talk about you love the Lord. Well, he, let listen. He's like, I don't know Jesus. I went that good. You need to have that conversation. That means I can't marry you. You need to talk about the things that involve your spirituality. Your weight involves spirituality. You can't serve God if you're unhealthy. I'm telling you, bring your life all into one. One God, one faith, one household, one family, one children, one wife. Yeah, stop getting two and three of them puppies. <laughs> you better get one. One is enough. Amen. Most of our lives are spent at work in the world. So it makes sense to us to use those things as developing tools. A, you know that most Christians spend most of their life at work? Do you know that? Well, then what? Duh. Why not use the job as a tool to develop you spiritually? In other words, come to church. Let us point out you need patience. Then we send you to work and the, pay, the work, the job works your patience. In other words, use the job to help you grow. Man, stop seeing the job as not the church. And let you, man, I walk into my job. That's my church. The church is helping me. The, the, the person who down the hall, the co-worker who gets on my last nerve, that's the church. The church is telling me, you better get it together, Cherry. You better get in. Oh, man, this is so good. Pastors have to do a better job at integrating worship with your world of work and living every day. We should be able to say on Monday, our church looks like. In other words, Monday, I should be able, our church, breath for change looks like what? Uniforms, looks like nurses' uniform. The church look like police officers. Church look like actors. Church look like hairstylists. Church look like uh, administrative assistants. The church looks like where you are on Monday. Our church should look like the active world. Breath for change serves seven days a week, and we must all see our lives as a sacrifice, and everything we do is before God. And when you see life, life this way. Your job helps you grow. Your spouse helps you grow. Your kids help you grow. Use all that stuff, man. Instead of talking about, I'm going through. Use everything to be better. Why? Because we're all trying to be better people. So in essence, the church teaches you what to develop. But when you go in the world, the world helps you develop it. The world tests you. It tests your patience. It tests your self-control. So my final passage is 1 Corinthians 12, 20 and 21. But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor again the head to the feet, I don't need you. I can't come to church and say, I don't need you. We can't go around saying we don't need each other. We are many, but still we're one, and that one is the person we're trying to become. We are many, but we're trying to become one. We're not perfect, Lisa. We're not perfect, Mama Kane. We're not perfect, Yanisha. We're not perfect, but we're trying to become one. And we should start thinking like that. How you moving this year? 
How you moving, little Ben? I'm moving as a unit. We are one positionally, but not practically yet. Now, I know people say they have their rights. I should be able to do what I want to do. Yep, that's true. But at what cost? What cost will you use your right? Technically, you are right, but you're wrong for demanding it at the expense of the greater good. This is the gospel in a nutshell, that he who, has com- who was completely right gave up his right to be right so we who were wrong could be made right like him. That is the gospel. And you want to run around talking about, I got to be right. So in my conclusion, let me give you a little John legend right here. If we're going to move, you have to move as a unit, move as a people, move as a family, move as a couple, move as an organization. If we're going to be, to make a difference in this world, we're going to have to learn how to move within the movement. We must join God's movement and go with his flow. And God's movement always includes other people. Why? Because he's the God of all kinds of children. He designed it that way for us to work with one another. So my getting better helps others get better. So instead of tearing each other down, see us as a unit that will only arrive if we get there together. So if I tear you down, I'm tearing down the other part of the house. To leave you behind is not biblical. God says, you who are spiritual, bear one another's burdens. You cannot pastor a church and not bring the woman along who had a baby out of wedlock, who stole something, who has a record. Help people get to the destination. Turn around and go back and help somebody. Yes, heaven will be a great place to be. And I do want to go there. I want to see my mama again, see my daddy. I want to see my friends. But what will make heaven better is that everybody there is perfect. Everybody, look, I don't want to be in heaven worried about is somebody about to go off? No. What makes heaven beautiful is that everybody there is perfect. And then we can all say, when we get to heaven, we made it. So be culture changers by becoming unity changers. When I move, you move. When you move, I move. When you see PC start moving, get start to moving. When I have my kids following me, and when you see daddy get up, move it. Move, move it, follow in order. The, even the ducks, the little ducklings, they follow after mama. John Legend has a song called When You Move, I Move. And he talks about not needing words to tell me what to do. He says, I will move when you move. In other words, I don't need for you to tell me when it's time to move. Just move and I'll follow you. He says, I will move when you move. When I feel or sense you going left, I will move too. Sometimes when I'm showing Joy how to dance, you know, I say, it ain't a one, two, it ain't a one, two, it ain't always on beat. Just follow me. When I move, you move. When you see me go left, just go left, Joy. When you see me go right, go right. If I lean you back like that, I'm about to dip you. Lean on back. In other words, when you move, when I move, you move. When you move, I'm following you. That's the beauty of partner dancing. Solo dancing is when you come out and you just do whatever you want to do. You ain't got to move with nobody. But couples have to learn how to move together. Have you watched Dancing with the Stars? You got to learn how to move together. You got to work your lines. You got to hold hold your pulleys. You got to be able to connect. You only win when you're together. So John Legend's course, the song says, when you move, I move. He says, I'm caught in your groove. Yeah, I'm going to stay right next to you. Wherever you're going, I'm going too. It says, if you hurt, I bleed. That's how this works. I put you first. (laughs) I use this to say our goal is to be forming so much into God. Our intense focus on what people think becomes irrelevant. We stop living to what the, the beat of people. We start living to the beat of God. We are so in tune with God that when he moves, we move. <laughs> he doesn't have to speak to us and say, now, Cherry, go to the, ah, I can sense him moving. I don't have to be told what to do. I feel him. And we don't need a word. We just need a move. Somebody said, we used to say, oh, I need a word from God. You got a whole bunch of word and you ain't doing nothing. What you need now is a move. Somebody say, move me, God. We follow him. We sense him. We know him. What he feels 
feels we should feel and the parallels go on and on. So move with God, move in him. As the scripture says in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. So my question to you today is how will you move the rest of your year? I hope it is in unity with God. I'm PC, and that's all I've got.